coaches. It is a pleasure to present to you the former football coach of the University of Illinois, Mr. Ray Elliott. Mr. Elliott's experience in athletics qualifies him to speak to you on one of the most important aspects of football, the proper state of mind. And now, Mr. Elliott. I, I have three facets of this mind that I'd like to emphasize. And I believe that they're in inverse order of importance. One, courage. The courage to throw your bodies around with a reckless abandonment of the field of play. And in football, we're going to have what is called contact courage. We've got to hit men. And we've got to hit them hard. And we can't flinch. Can you do something about courage? Well, of course you can. If you work at it, if you coach off the field a little bit, of course you can. I'd hate like the devil to have to tell you how many fellows I poured courage down their throats. I'd hate like the devil to have to line up before you the men that I put a strong thing up and down a guy's spine. I wouldn't know what to do, fellas, if I didn't have to do something about this courage business. I just don't tell a fellow get down off the squad just because he likes it. I can do something about it. And we do something about it by teaching him, talking with him, giving him some beliefs, putting something in his spine that should be there, teaching him to be a man and not a coward, teaching him not to duck his head, keep it up. Courage. And we hope as athletic coaches, don't we, that we can temper courage of young America so they'll go out in this old world and get the job done, the real job of living a big life, courageously, and not ducking the big issues of the world, but living it courageously. The second thing is what I'd call game intelligence, smartness on the field, smartness off the field, game intelligence. How to handle yourself out there. Smartness, not just in the calling of plays, but smartness in attacking the problem that's before you. The problem of getting this guy out of the play. And not just beating my head, my brains out, and trying to do something that I can do with the help of my mind. I refer this the same as I say as uh, uh, law intelligence, or medical intelligence, or farming intelligence. Game intelligence, smartness on the field, and smartness off the field taking good care of your lives, studying, doing the things you've got to do to be a better man. Can you influence them this time? Yeah, you can influence them, if you want to. Smartness. We could almost say the more, uh, think of the situation you'd like to have back in your lifetime again, huh? Whew. I know I'd like to have a lot back. Little darn mistakes we made. But even that isn't the most important thing. The most important thing of all, gentlemen, is, and I don't have a right good name for it, because uh, uh, I'm not that kind of a guy. It's, it's just a simple old thing. It's common sense, I guess. It's, uh, it's, it's this thing. It's, uh, it's the proper state of mind. The proper state of your mind. And by the proper state of mind, I perhaps mean to find that dynamic something that comes into their hearts and souls that says, I can, I will, I must, that regardless of odds, regardless of odds, regardless of what the odds may be, I will get the job done. Tempered only, if you will, by the phrase, in a sportsmanlike way. There is no sabre, as we well know, to the victory that's ill-gotten. And we can only enjoy that, that we won in a sportsmanlike way. That is living by the rules as they are given to you that come out of that book that you have. And not only the rule book that you carry on football, but another book. Another book called the Bible. The will to win, the will to succeed. That dynamic something that comes into my heart 
that makes me get the job done regardless of odds, and I'm going to say regardless of odds 20 times this afternoon, sir, because that's the important. Anyone can do the easy things of life to do. Don't take credit for doing the things that everybody does every day in the week. I got off the plane in, in Tokyo not so long ago. 36 hours across the Pacific Ocean? 36 hours across water all the time? And when I got off at the Nita Airport there, oh, I am. Boy, Elliot, what a guy you are. You're terrific. Why, why you're a pioneer. You've crossed the Pacific Ocean in a plane. And then right when I was slapping myself on the back, you know, I all of a sudden came up abruptly to the thought, gee, every day there's people doing that. So what I'm doing is not so great. Every day they're doing it. Right at this moment, there's hundreds of kids, people going across that Pacific Ocean in planes. And then, 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 then you know, my hand really stopped short when I was praising myself there, when I all of a sudden thought that not so long ago, a guy went across the Atlantic Ocean in a crate, a guy named Lindbergh. Yeah. All too often, you know, we think we're great guys. Gee. Football's a great level, and holy cow, any one of you fellas or any of us that can think that we're great and we're the only thing in the world, why well, sure, I think you should have a warm confidence in your heart, a belief that you're a fine man, sure. But this stuff of thinking we're great because when that sets in, self-satisfaction sets in, sir, there's only one way we can go, and that's down. We can't go up. How can we go up? We believe we're the best now. The state of mind, the proper state of mind. When you can get the boys to the proper state of mind, sir, you've got a winner. You've got a winner. Whenever I think of that, I, I, I think of, oh, I think of a game down in Champaign not so long ago, the year we won a championship. I can always think of that Wisconsin team as long as I had a nice young team here come along, not very big. The opponents outweighed us this afternoon, 21 pounds to a man. I had a young linebacker named Boyle. Now, don't get me wrong. When I give you my stories of these things, these few things, facts I'm going to bring before you, you've got them too in your universities and in your life and your coaching experience. And you know how far one yard is? 36 inches? Three feet? The longest darn thing in the world when you've got a defensive and the... I mean, the shortest darn thing, the longest darn thing when you're trying to get it, one yard. Johnny Coda took his Wisconsin team back in the huddle. And as Johnny was about to enter the huddle, this kid Borio of mine, 187 pound, I repeat that, fullback, linebacker of mine, hollered to Johnny, hey, Johnny, send Amici at me. Send Amici at me, he said. Can you see the audacity of the guy? Hell, most of us would hope he'd gone lost some way, wouldn't he? <laughs> Do you get the impact of this thing, sir? Do you get the impact? Send a Michi at me. 70,000 people looking at us, one yard away from something. And Johnny sent him there. And Chuck got him back for a three-yard loss. And when the four downs were over, instead of that ball crossing that one-yard stripe, it rested on a six-yard line. Gentlemen, one yard from the winning of the game. One yard from the Big Ten Championship. One yard from the Rose Bowl Championship. One yard from success or failure. One yard from distinction or nothing. And in the game of life that you play, that could be well one inch. Or not turning the right corner or not having the guts to open the right door, or pitying yourself by saying, I can't go on one yard, how can I do it? Yes, one yard from being somebody. Yeah, when I think of those things, I think of in the war years, the last war years at the university. We, didn't, we weren't blessed with a Navy program or a Marine program, or anything like that. We had nothing like that at all. Anything that could breathe could play at our place. As long I'll never forget that summer of 19, 
43, this young chap walked into my office, 139 pound halfback, Eddie Bray, said, I want to play Big Ten football. When I took one look at him, I thought, boy, we've really gone to the bottom of the barrel now, I'll guarantee you. But if I had to pick my all-time backfield, sir, I hasten to say, he would be my left halfback because of four years of college football in the Big Ten. He owns an average yard for a try of 7.1. And while he wasn't a speed team and couldn't make the track team, and while he wasn't a big boy, he had a heart as big as this room. He had a never-say-die spirit. And I was proud of that 1944 team, gentlemen. We gave out 27 letters in 1944, and 21 of the 27 letters went to 17-year-old boys. When they became 18, they were gone on the surface. Two of the remaining six letters went to 16-year-old boys. And that team led the United States of America in yards gained. They had nine touchdowns taken away from them during the course of the season, and the three of those touchdowns had stuck. They'd have been national champions. Schedule, huh? Well, we played seven Big Ten schools. We played Notre Dame, and we played Great Lakes. And I'd like to take you to the Great Lakes game for just one moment, because Paul Brown, then the coach at Great Lakes, must have stopped every monster over 270 pounds that came in the station and put a suit on. <laughs> I, I, I swear to God, I never saw so many monsters in my life now, I'm telling you. It was so big they couldn't play a six-man line, they had to play a five-man line, the few were the right. <laughs> all pro tackles, all American, all this and that. We had a kid named Jim Reader on. It was an all-American tackle. He was playing third team for them. Oh, that Brown is an organizer. I'll go with you. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, oh yeah, Yule of Iowa was a quarterback, Sands of Southern Cal left halfback, Avery of Minnesota at the right halfback spot, Mello, the All-American from Notre Dame at fullback. Hmm, Bray, 139 at left half for me. <laughs> McGovern, 158 at right halfback there. And that snarling devil from Collinville, fullback, 167. <laughs> I led the boys on the field. We always walked hand in hand on the field those days. <laughs> Responsible for these kids away from home now. <laughs> we loosened up in the end zone, that's all we needed. We went back in, we had a cup of tea, we talked it over. <laughs> I said to those kids, now look, how many of you, I want to run a test here too, how many of you kids are willing to play this game? And the whole 27 stood up. And I was really proud of young America at that time. Well, so we went out in the field and we led it the first half, 19 to 6. We couldn't hold on. The game ended in a 26 to 26 tie. But with 26 to 26 on that store scoreboard and 19 seconds left, Mr. Mello, the All-American Notre Dame, broke to the middle of the line and started Goldwood. And the only thing that was between him and a touchdown was his kid, Bray. And when I saw those two bodies coming close together, <laughs> I'm really wondering what I'm going to say to Mrs. Bray next Monday. That's about disaster. But I looked up in time to see and to hear one of the greatest tackles I've ever seen or heard in the football field in my life when that kid put those puny old shoulders under the oncoming piston-like legs of that Mr. Mello and picked him up and laid him back the way he was coming from and then laid on him until the clock ran out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got a chuckle out of that for a moment. But listen to me, please, sir. This is the truth. I've got the moving pictures. And I'd like to ask you just a question. What did the job there? Bones and muscles? His biceps muscles no bigger than my thumb. <laughs> and you know, he could have done like so many guys do in games, not want to meet that buzzsaw head on. He could have dove along the green swat and made a good college try at it, you know? Made everyone believe heck he was courageous in that. You duck things in the game of life too, don't you know? You duck them. Think right now there's so many things you should do. But you'll let her go because you either haven't got the courage to do it or the will desire to do it or you're putting something off that you do right away. That kid put nothing off, sir. He met the problem head on. 
He didn't say, oh, why did you put me here? He asked no quarter. He just wanted to shot at that guy, and he brought him down. And what brought him down? Bones and muscles, I say? No, sir, a heart, a big heart, a desire, a will, a never-say-die spirit, regardless of odds, regardless of odds. He got the job done. Big heart. You've seen it in our, on our gridirons all of your life. Baseball fields and everything else. It's like Lou Boudreau. Good Lord, I don't know if you know it or not, but Lou Boudreau was the manager of the Cleveland Indians. I know him real well, he's a good friend of mine. Manager of the Cleveland Indians, there's nine more games to play. One day Boston's in the first place, one day Detroit's in, I mean Cleveland's in the first place. He benched himself, because you got a thumb here that might not do a good job of playing. They're playing in Detroit. I mean, playing, Detroit's playing at Cleveland. The, it's the last of the ninth inning. The bases are loaded. There are two out, and this boy at bat, Kennedy, it's a bat. The first one came in for a call strike. Remember now, everything means something now. Money, prestige, everything. The first one came in for a call strike. The second one came in too high. The third one, he swung and it missed, and the ball had no sooner settled than the catcher's mitt. And the announcer said, attention, please. Boudreau now batting for Cleveland. Do you get the impact of this thing? Here's the manager walking out of the dugout, swinging two bats. You've heard of guys doing things with two strikes on them, haven't you? Here it is. Before the whole world, walking up the plate, there's a little skinny guy with a big heart, big courage, big desire, believing in himself every moment, threw one of the bats away and stood up there in the first ball pitch, drove in the two runs that beat Detroit that night. Even if he had failed, he heard the courage of his convictions. He had a desire. He had a will. Spirit. Spirit. The will to win. I, I, do any of you in the room know a guy named Lincoln? Abraham, that is? You've heard of him, haven't you? Quite a man. I wonder how well you know him. I have a bust of Lincoln on my desk. And every time the going gets rough for me and I sit at that desk, he looks at me with a twinkle in his eye and he tells me something. You know what he tells me? He says, Ray, remember now, I tried 27 times to be elected to public office. 27 times I tried to be something and I failed 25 times. Did you ever stop to think of that guy at the end of the fifth time he failed? He couldn't have been our president. I wonder how many of you in this room can go on and fail five times and say, I'm late, I'm no good, they don't want me. Or can you go on and fail ten times and still with a chin high and a smile on your face go out to conquer and believe in yourself? I wonder how many of you fail, can fail 25 times and still believe in yourself enough to emerge triumphant to the greatest in the land. Now do you know him a little better? You know him a man of desire, of will, of belief in himself, of confidence to become one of our mortals in the presidency. Yes, sir. It's like Bing Crosby said to me one time, sing with your mouth? Oh, no, Ray, you don't sing with your mouth. You sing with your heart. Did you ever hear him sing White Christmas? Did you ever hear him sing Silent Night? From the heart of a man. The great paintings of the world done by a man's bones and muscles. Yes, educated muscles and bones, but all from the heart of a man. Heart of a man. You who lack the heart, you who have the spirit gone from you, you who have lost hope, you who have no confidence, you are dead, sir. You are done. It's like the young chap in high school had, had only one leg. Young fella, no one believed in the boy but the coach who kept after him. Everybody was discouraging the guy because you can't go on and be a decent swimmer. He went on through college and became a swimming champion. And then, sir, do you know that he became the 440-yard Olympic champion swimmer? 
regardless of odds. Yes, sir. The blind golfers that go out there and shoot in the 90s can't see. Just think what they're drawing on in this world to do this thing. Just imagine the, the, the will and desire that they've got to have to get the job done, regardless of odds. The will to succeed, the will to win, that dynamic something that comes in your very hearts and soul. I know you all have legends at your school. Every school right here has a legend. At, a, at the University of Illinois, we have a legend, too. It brings me back to 1939, when a little band of kids at Illinois had to meet the most powerful juggernaut in the nation. And I'm referring to the University of Michigan team that had five All-Americans on it. It was Harmon at tailback, Westfall at fullback, Frutig at left end, Ingalls at center, and Evashevsky at blocking back the year before they had won the national championship. And here they are coming now, the same group of men. Oh, what a powerful bunch of men. At Illinois, we had no All-Americans. We were a bunch of babies. We had one good leader, a kid named Brewer, our captain, a real fine football player. What had Michigan done? The first four games before they met us, well, they beat Michigan State by a big score. The second game, they beat a great Iowa team, the only team that Iowa lost that year by a big score, and I'd like to pause right now and pay my tribute, my humble way, to one of America's finest athletes, one of America's fine gentlemen, a man who died in that war when he didn't have to die, the captain of the Iowa team, Niall Kinnick. And then they went on, they beat Chicago by 85 points. They beat the toast of the East Yale by a big score. What did we do in our first four games? Well, sir, in the first game, we tied Bradley, nothing to nothing. In the second game, we lost to Southern Cal by a big score. In the third game, we lost to Indiana by a big score. In the fourth game, we lost to Wisconsin by a big score. And to make matters even worse, the Monday of the week we won't have to play this Michigan team, we lost the services of our captain, Brewer, our inspiration, our leader, who was called home because of the death of his mother. Gentlemen, he had just lost God's most precious gift to man, his mom. He went on home. It was our custom in those days to take the boys to the Champaign Country Club the night before all home games where Coach Zupke, where we could feed them and house them and Coach Zupke would talk to them. It was his custom to talk about 8 o'clock in the evening to the boys and I'd like to bring you in that room for a moment because the boys were all sitting around their wicker chairs no lights on the room, just a light from the fireplace here casting his flickering rays across the face of the boys. And he was talking about the reminders of the next day. When all of a sudden the door opened in the corner of the room and Captain Brewer came in and, and sat down on the floor. And Zup saw who it was and went over and offered that boy beautiful fatherly condolences. And he turned to go back to the platform, but he never reached there because there was a rustle in the corner of the room and Captain Brewer stood up. And in a voice that could be, well, described as trembling and tearful, he said, fellas, my sister and my daddy, join me in sending many thanks to you for your beautiful flowers and telegrams. And then his voice almost became rasping when he said, if you feel the way I do right now, I didn't travel this 250 miles or nothing. If you feel the way I do right now, we'll go out and beat the hell out of Michigan tomorrow. He sat down, the boys turned to the front of the room, and I wish you could have seen it. I wish you could have been in that room. Electricity. You could have cut it. The feeling in there. Tears coming from the eyes of these boys. Zup saw anything he'd say from then on was anachromatic, and he stopped, and he says, dismissed. And whereas it's awfully hard to get those kids to bed at 10 o'clock, even though there are the beds, and here are we, every boy was in his bunk that night at five minutes after nine, and nobody asked him to be there. And I walked down the long line of cops, I couldn't believe myself. No polo fights, no kidding, no, 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 no nothing just going on. Just kids staring at a ceiling or laying on their fronts. And as I approached the light switch, they said, good night, coach. And I turned around and I went on home. I knew something had to happen. We came back the next day. We entered the stadium. As I entered the stadium, sir, and you're talking about sportsmanship and in the game of football, uh, sportsmanship and all over this world. We walked in that day, a manager from the Michigan team gave me a note addressed to Mel Brewer, 
And standing there right beside it, Mel, he says, open it, coach, and read it. And I open it. And it went something like this. Dear Mel, we of Michigan ho uh, send our condolences to you because of a loss of your mom. We hope you're back in time to play against her, and she, because we wouldn't want to play against a weakened team. And went on and on with some very lovely words, signed by the entire Michigan football team and its coaching staff. Sportsman at its highest. We went to the dressing room, we dressed, we went on the football field, we loosened up, we came back in, and something happened in that dressing room that I've never seen, I have never seen before in the dressing room. When Coach Zupke called off each starter in the game, everybody else in the room came to his feet and gave that guy a tremendous ovation and charged him with the responsibilities of the day. I was the last guy to say goodbye to 11 starters that went by me, and usually they'd come up and say, no way, we'll take care of it, and they didn't say a word. Went by me. You know the rest of the story. That afternoon, one of the greatest, one of the greatest, one of the greatest upsets in the history of the Big Ten took place when a little band of fighting Illini beat the finest team in America, 19 to 6. And the guy that started us off kicking three points to the bars, who had never kicked a field goal in life, was Brewer. When it came to that fourth and nine down there on the 18-yard line, he put it through to start us off. Tom Harmon has told me many times he never was hit so hard and so often in his life as he was that afternoon. I played pro ball, he said, I played Big Ten football, I played everywhere, I never hit so hard in my life. And he did this, you know. He averaged 165 yards a game before he came to Champaign. That afternoon he walked out of the stadium minus 19 yards. Now we can say, can't we gentlemen, that the same team that tied Bradley beat the finest team in America, 16, 19 to six, can't we? Oh no, we can't, sir. No, we can't. It was the same orange and blue spangles it was the same teeth and eyes and ears and mouth and body, the same agilities, the same skills, the same speeds, but not the same men, sir, because manhood comes from within your heart. How you believe, regardless of odds, never to flinch on the field of play or in the battle of life, never to flinch. The will to succeed, sir. I know if I could open a cubby hole, each one of those hearts that went on the field that day, I probably could see embellished across the hearts of it like this. If you feel the way I do right now, we'll go out and beat the hell out of Michigan today. The will to succeed. Without it, you're dead. And as far as I'm concerned, gentlemen, with due respect to the O's and X's, that is the beginning and the end and the in-between of football. Now look, I'm out of it right now. But I've loved every moment as being a football coach. You are great guys. You've got these kids in the palm of your hand, sir. You're wonderful. I love to come to places like this because I meet the classiest men in America. Great kids, great men, sportsmen. Love this game and never flinch no matter how rough it comes your way. And if they start from the stands to start criticizing you and your boys, Oh, defend yourself and defend those kids with your life because you're in this great game where you do so many great things for young America. I hope you win them all. Good night. God bless you.